welcome to Healthcare IT Today. I'm John Lynn, together with my colleague and friend, Colin Hahn. The world of technology and healthcare are ever-changing in new and novel ways, and that's why we love this stuff. So join us as we discuss the latest healthcare and health IT news meshed together in new ways which help generate ideas and new perspectives. Plus, we'll have a little fun along the way. Today, we're going to be doing a review of the spring health IT conferences. And be sure to follow the show on social media at the hashtag HITSM and our personal accounts at TechGuy and at Colin underscore Hung. Plus, check out our 17 years of health IT blog content at healthcareittoday.com. So are you tired, worn out, excited, exhilarated? What, what's, your, what's, your, what's your emotional reaction to conferences being back? <laughs> I think all of the above. I'm definitely, <laughs> I'm definitely very tired after, um, after this, the spring conference season, but definitely uh, energized too by what we've all seen and the people we've met and everything like that. So it definitely feels like this is the year that people have finally come back after the pandemic. Yeah. That's fair. And I have good news. Next year, Vive and Hims are only three weeks apart rather than four. So you'll be even more tired. That's <laughs> <laughs> Those two conferences in particular, back to back, is the tough run uh, of the spring conferences. But it is a lot of fun to see people and, you know, at both and both and also people who only go to one or the other. It, it, both of those conferences are quite, quite awesome for meeting people. For sure. Well, and our marketing friends love that one's in LA and one's in Cal in Florida. So, you know, could you have it further apart? <laughs> but, you know, they're up for the challenge. They'll be. Yeah. Fun. The airlines love us. The airlines love us. <laughs> the so, shipping, the booths, that's the tough part. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, John, what are some of the interesting technology trends that you've noticed or seen in the 2023 uh, conferences so far? You know, I, I, we always say we need to go back to our previews and see how we did. So we kind of <laughs> are doing that. And I'm proud to say that we were right, that workforce revenue dominated the conversation and then AI everything. So, you know, from a tech perspective, the most sexy thing in all of healthcare right now is AI everything, which includes chat GPT, which is the sexiest of AI right now. <laughs> so if you, if you had, you know, what is it? The Miss America pageant? You know, uh, Chad GPT <laughs> is winning right now. The, the pageant is the front runner. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that was the biggest thing everywhere you went was, hey, how are we incorporating this? What does this mean? How are we going to do it? I mean, even the big EHR vendors who, to be quite frank, for the last number of years have kind of been pretty apathetic to pushing out new technology, probably because they were too busy building towards meaningful use and to the EHR certification. And so they were busy doing that, that they weren't implementing a lot of really other new technology. Now AI has in chat GPT and everything around large language models has kind of forced their hand to implement some of these things as well. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, AI and in particular chat GPT was the hot technology, right? I mean, it, it was sprinkled on every booth. It was sprinkled <laughs> through all the different uh, sessions. Uh, AI was definitely the topic du jour. And, and as you said, it was both um, for clinical application, but also just sort of mundane use in in like uh, making it easier to enter certain things or chatbots for use on websites. So it wasn't like, you know, they were revolutionizing how they were using AI, but it was certainly brought forward by a lot of companies that we saw. For me, the, the surprise was the strength of revenue cycle. Uh, just looking at the booths from people who were in the sort of RCM space, they were definitely present. Uh, you know, companies like uh, Novalon, Waystar, and others, just the size of their booth, the, the number of people they had, to me, that was sort of an interesting technology trend. And, and they seemed busy the few times that I saw them. Lots of people going over to talk about how can we, you know, ensure that our revenues are up and what can we do to make sure our claims go through. There's lots of discussion around just how do we squeeze more from the revenue that we do have. So I was just a little bit surprised that the busyness of those booths that we saw. Well, and I think that is a shift for HIMSS in particular, which always had a you know, spattering of RCM people, but they often would just attend. So, so you're right, you know, FinThrive had a big presence there as well. I mean, mm -hmm. there were just a bunch of the RCM vendors, which begs the question, is RCM becoming more of a tech priority and a tech solution and tech, you know, responsibility by the CIO 
uh, you know, as versus the CFO, uh, which is where it was before, which is why HFMA was so big, which, you know, I have no doubt HFMA is going to do just fine in <laughs> shortly as well, uh, because that discussion is so important. The CFO obviously still does care, but it, that might indicate an interesting shift towards the CIO having much more involvement because now your patient payment, payment platform is a tech solution, right? Or your, you know, your AI chatbot on the website is a tech solution, which interestingly gets into marketing, which is another overlap, you know, RCM tech and marketing. No wonder it's such a challenge to implement. So, you know, I get where you're coming from there. Yeah, the financial, to me, the financial experience has become much more a uh, big thing. And that falls definitely more into the CIO's world just because, you know, of the payment options, payment plans, and, you know, all the stuff that is that has to be made available via text and via the website for patients. That's definitely something that uh, I, I saw on display. And, and to your point, John, yeah, you I mean, there were so many other players, including a lot of banks, Right? There yeah. were a lot of banks at Hims, which is not usually, you know, the case. Usually yeah, I saw Key Bank, I saw Bank of America, and yeah. yeah, that's true. I hadn't seen them at Hims before. You know, maybe at some of the smaller conferences that are specific to local organizations or doctors' offices, you'd see them occasionally, but not at Hims. You know, the other thing that I saw that I, I would say is a, a big trend that. Uh, I think is a good trend and it's probably a post meaningful use EHR incentive money trend <laughs> that, that, that we needed to get out of. And that was that the bottom line really matters. Mm. And so the discussion about, Hey, not only is how is this technology work, but how are we going to implement, you know, how are we going to impact the bottom line? How are we going to impact quality which I include in the bottom line, right? And then also your workforce. So if you get that, you know, that, that, that's the new, uh, you know, triple aim, right? <laughs> like, let's redefine that as the new triple aim is, you know, it needs to help you on the revenue slash cost side of things and have a good ROI. It needs to impact your workforce and improve everything that's happened there. And it needs to improve clinical quality for the patients. So there's a lot more of that discussion and leading with that as opposed to, hey, here's this new technology you should buy us versus someone else, which was the discussion during meaningful use because it's like, okay, which EHR vendor should I pick versus what's the ROI of picking one? No, you're right. I mean, that leads to something that I saw as well, which was a bit of a surprise to me. And that was just the number of, uh, of companies as well as conversations around data quality. Uh, you know, clinical architecture, even Greenway and Altera, you know, the discussions I had with executives from those companies, they were all talking about the work they were putting in to help their clients refine and define better the data that they've collected. So although, you know, definitely a goal is still interoperability, a, a larger goal these days seems to be about getting the quality of the data higher so that you can leverage the AIs, the data analytics, and all the things that you want to do. Uh, but without clean data, you can't do that. That's a good point. I mean, I did an interview with Veronovum that you'll be able to check out soon on Healthcare IT Today, but he talked about kind of this inflection point for them where people are finally waking up that's like, okay, I really need this data to be clean so it's actionable. And he talks about levels of, of clean data, right? You know, if it's a chat bot, maybe there's some flexibility. Whereas if it's some high-end clinical use case that need, you know, it needs to be more precise and the, the quality of the data needs to be much higher and how do we get there? So I think that was definitely a topic of the conversation. It was interesting to hear him talk about how the customers are waking up. I, you know, I kind of dove in a little bit. I was like, so what woke them up to it? <laughs> and they're like, well, they just realized these technologies are here, but if their data is bad, they don't, they can't get access to them. They can't leverage them. So that is a shift in mindset. Yeah. Particularly, you know, my conversation with Charlie Harp over at Clinical Architecture, he pointed out that data quality doesn't mean that, hey, we got the wrong data in the database. That's actually pretty solvable and, and has been solved by most organizations. It's more of, hey, wait a minute, the, how you defined this data element here in this organization is different than this. Uh, so he's talking about obviously semantic interoperability, but just solving that and getting the data cleansed and norm normalized, that's the bigger challenge for the organization. And, and we don't often think about that when we think about data quality, which is part of that shift you're talking about, John, where it's a mind shift change, where we now have to take, we're now finding that executives are starting to care about this kind of stuff because they can't use those lovely new technologies without it. Yeah, one other technology that's fascinating that kind of overlaps this for a while, you know, is, is a company like Massimo, 
which kind of more med device company it feels like, right? Because it's right. all these sensors and, and wearables and things that we've talked about many times before, but seeing how they're applying that together with their dashboards in the ICU and then this eventually to the home or every exam room, the ICU, sick bay is doing really interesting things with that as well, you know, as far as all these, and, you know, they're device agnostic, use whatever dice we want, but we want to be the dashboard that collects all this information and then funnels that up to people. It goes to back to what is the quality of the data? The nice thing is with med devices, we know the quality because the FDA has regulated that. And so it's at least trusted in a certain way more than other uh, other areas of data like the EHR, which, you know, is trustworthy for billing, but maybe not for clinical in many use cases. So I think those types of companies that are integrating the device data, the wearable data, even the at-home data, uh, you know, and putting them into dashboards, making them usable is another one that I, I don't remember seeing that many medical device companies at, at HIMSS, but they were definitely there this time. And Vive, uh, you know, has definitely had plenty because of the health connection. Any particular topics, John, that maybe weren't tied to a technology that you heard or saw at the conferences so far? Yeah, so I would say, uh, you know, hot topics that... Uh, you know, were of discussion for me, I, I, I think it was maybe the government regulation mm. and, and where is it headed? There was a lot of like questions about what else are we going to see? For example, like what's happening with privacy and HIPAA? And what's going to happen? You know, I think we got a, a, a interim rule uh, on on some of that, but uh, you know, like there's fear of is there more coming? Is there consumer privacy protection that we've talked about before? Is that coming? So there's this discussion of that. Uh, you know, we had some people talking about incentives for security, uh, which is an interesting idea. I've heard that from a number of different security companies. Which, you know, th there were a lot of security companies. I would say that well, that's the other one that was in full force at, at both Hims and Vive was the number of security companies. The whole security section had 30, 50 vendors, many from without healthcare. And then of course you still had the stalwarts that have lots of healthcare, like Fortifield Health Security and Proofpoint and Fortinet and you know that have always right. had a big presence. But then there's all these others that might be doing some other security in another area that that are really interesting. So you know, are there going to be incentives for this? Because there's the natural incentive is just avoiding a breach, but it's tough for boards to really quantify that, right? Uh, they're getting better, it seems like. That's that's maybe the takeaway from this, but, you know, that, that that's an interesting discussion. And then I'll just throw one more out there around information blocking and potentially more incentives or and or penalties that are going to be coming down the road for that. And so, you know, I think this is a topic that, Obviously, you know, any government regulation impacts healthcare in a big way. Yeah, you know, no doubt. I also would have to agree with you on the topic of uh, incentives for security. I mean, I think at Vive, I had probably about four or five conversations with people that were talking about, hey, why not do something similar to what we did for meaningful use, but for security? I mean, healthcare security is, is behind. We know it's sort of a, a, I won't say a national security issue, but it's it's definitely something we don't want crippled. Yeah. And so, you know, is there some money that could be made available by governments to, uh, uh, to, to help organizations get uh, better and uh, improve their cybersecurity. So that definitely to me was the most interesting uh, topic that wasn't necessarily related to particularly healthcare, um, a healthcare or clinical topic. But the other one that for me was uh, a hot topic of discussion was actually international. Uh, and two, two, two things on that. One, what can we learn from other places? For the first time, I heard people wanting to find out what is working at the NHS and how can we bring that over here to the mm. U.S.? I hadn't heard this kind of discussion before. So this opening of uh, or accepting uh, open-mindedness of looking at Singapore and Australia and what's working in the EU and kind of taking from there and bringing it over to the US, but also heard from a lot of countries like Brazil and in Africa, uh, you know, wanting to, to challenge the vendors in North America to go, hey guys, don't forget about us. And by the way, we can't afford the multi-million dollar implementations that have happened over here because we don't have those incentive dollars. What can you do for us to make your products usable? Because we want to be on those same systems. We want to leverage what you have learned. How can you help us? So that international element for me was an interesting uh, topic of discussion that what I wasn't expecting. 
I guess we better go to Hims uh, in Jakarta and the one in Portugal to to make sure we uh, hit those international perspectives. You're right, though. Uh, there was a panel I, I uh, moderated at the Dell Technologies booth around multi cloud, and we we invited a guy named San Luis Cruz from uh, uh, Juan Luis Cruz, excuse me, from uh, Madrid, and talking about his his hospital, uh, you know, and and how they didn't do cloud because for the longest time they couldn't meet the requirements of European uh, security. And so they didn't. Uh, and there was an interesting discussion though around, are you missing out on some of the benefits of cloud that you would have had if you could have implemented it? But also that, you know, he, he said, yeah, with our hospital, it's data privacy first, which is a, a fascinating viewpoint that we can probably learn from. Now the cloud vendors are there where they could do this. And right. so it's changing the discussion, but we're going to benefit from the discussions of the international community, just like you described. Hey, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to Healthcare IT Today with John Lin and Colin Hung. Today, we're talking about the spring 2023 conferences and the trends and interesting things we've noticed. Um, so, John, let me ask you this question. Was there anything that was missing or lacking from the 2023 spring conferences that you saw? Yeah, you know, when I first thought about this, the first thing that came to mind was patience. Uh, you know, there were some, there was a smattering, you know, I, I think there was a panel at, at HIMSS, there was, you know, a uh, savvy co-op had, had worked with uh, Vive a bit to have some patient questions and, and things like that. Uh, it, maybe that was health. So maybe I'm going back to fall, but I know they're working on it for Vive as well. But, uh, you know, th so there's, there's a number of options, but certainly it's a challenging thing. And we know that as event organizers, how do you get the patients involved and how do you get their perspective and make sure it's part of the conversation? Uh, you know, and I think it's, I think that there's a little nuance to the discussion that I think some people miss. For example, when we were doing some panels, we had a, we had a cloud one and we had a security one and we're like, should we put a patient on there? Right? Like, do they really care about cloud? And we're like, well, it's fine from a perspective that, yeah, if the cloud goes down, they're going to be impacted. And it's important to remember that. But can they really have a discussion about, you know, multi-cloud and, and the type, you know, return to service and all this, right? If, if it's a real technical discussion. So I think there's some nuance there that we need to include in the discussion. But, I, you know, that's the thing I think we should have more of is more patience. Uh, I had one patient tell us so much is that every sponsor as part of their sponsorship should be included money towards bringing patients to have that discussion, which would be an interesting thing to do. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how that how vendors would react to that. Uh, but, you know, having more patients there would have rounded out the discussion a bit. Yeah, definitely. I have to agree with you on that. Say yes. There's oh, we can always use more patients at any conference. Uh, and so there ever enough patients? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's there's never enough. Um, so I think that's definitely true. I think the other thing that for me was um, maybe missing or lacking. I got to be honest. Uh, providers, there just weren't as many provider organizations at the conferences. Uh, this spring. I mean, we kind of knew this might happen or suspected this might happen, maybe because of budgets, uh, maybe because of busyness. Um, but just it was surprising to me um, how how little they were around in the exhibit hall. Now, maybe I missed them completely. Maybe they just didn't go to the exhibit halls at all. But usually you see a few of them around. I mean, we did see a few. We saw a few of our friends, obviously. But to me, a lot of them were just like either in and out just for the session they were presenting or the panel that were, they were on. And it wasn't uh, that representative. Like just looking down the list, there weren't that many provider organizations. So you know, I, I chalk that up to the economy, not the conferences themselves. I think people want to be there, but just this year just didn't happen. It's interesting. I actually feel the opposite. And it might be partially because of the past couple of years and conferences the past couple of years. But I would say this is the most providers I've seen at a conference is 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 that it finally feels like they're back. Uh, you know, is, is it the meaningful use 50,000 hymns event? No, of course not. Right. Like, but I, I think, you know, I saw a lot of them. And in the presentations that I was part of and the ones I was in, I was shocked by how the people who would sit down and that were from the government, they were from a hospital health system, they're learning and, you know, taking part in the session and, and joining the discussion. So I was actually pleasantly surprised by how many providers I thought it would be less. So, you know, maybe it was a little skew of my own perspective in, in the past couple of years, but I was, I was actually impressed with it there. 
you know, the thing that I think that was somewhat disappointing topic wise and thing I wish was, you know, that felt missing or kind of lacking is the kind of practical discussions. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. AI was so sexy and interoperability and Tefka with, you know, Q hens is so sexy, et cetera. Yeah. Like there's some things that just like, obviously they need to have some of that. Right. But where were some of the more practical discussions around, Hey, I have aging infrastructure. What am I going to do? Right. Or, you know, like even some of the practical cybersecurity, that might be the most practical discussions they had, but they were often so high level about, yeah, security is a problem. It keeps me up at night, right? Like, let's dive into how are you doing network segmentation? And, you know, how, you know some of those real practical things, I think that those were missing from the, the conferences in the spring session that, you know, I think I would have loved to see. And I get it. It's tough for you to book when you're a conference organizer, you know, a chat GPT session up against a network segmentation session, you know, for security, uh, you know, we know which one everyone's going to want to go to. So it, it is somewhat of a self-fulfilling uh, thing that, you know, is a problem. But uh, yeah, that, you know, I think those those discussions happen in the vendor booths in specific meetings where they were like, hey, here's our problem and we need to solve this. So I think they were happening at the conference, but it was interesting that the conference itself didn't facilitate some of that learning or broader sharing of the information that way. Yeah, one of the things that was lacking for me, and this is a call out for companies that play in this space, like Esri or Gozio, there was a complete lack of real-time location-based information in the exhibit halls. I mean, you would have figured that either a Vive or Health uh, or or Hims could team with one of these RTLS vendors to say, hey, listen, here's an interactive map of the exhibit hall. Here's where you are and here's where you need to go, right? Mm-hmm. And, and draw a path for you. I mean, it would be such an easy demonstration of the power of that kind of technology. Neither of them had that. Now, I'm not blaming them for not having it. I'm just saying that there was a missed opportunity there to really showcase a, an interesting technology. For So for me, that was one thing that was missing. I wonder if it's kickback from the RFID stuff they did before where they were trying to track leads. And so, you know, they took it too far and now they're scared of doing something like that. (laughs) Could be, but just some simple wayfinding, I think would be a nice touch. But overall, John, what's your impression of the spring conferences? I mean, we've been to Vive, we've been to HIMSS, we've been to a few other conferences as well. We had our own HITMIC conference. Um, From just a pure event standpoint, what's your impressions? I mean, you know, when COVID hit and we started doing all these virtual events, people were like, do we need conferences? Should we be traveling everywhere and joining, you know, like all this? <laughs> and I, I think that the spring has shown that, yes, they're here to stay. We value them. We value the interactions, the engagement, the bumping into the line and coffee, bumping into the hotel room, you know, <laughs> as you're going there at the parties, like those connections are extremely valuable. What I what I think it actually illustrates too is that it's not as much about the education and it's all about the people and connections and being able to see a bunch of vendors in the same place, et cetera, right? It's about those efficiencies as opposed to education. Because if the conferences were just education, then virtual would have been a fine replacement. But I think what we've seen is that it's not a fine replacement. And so, it, you know, the, the, we want all the rest and the, the, those things are hard to replicate in the virtual world. And so I think conferences will be as big or as, you know, and even bigger than they were pre-COVID. Yeah, I, I have to say attendance was certainly surprising, uh, surprisingly good uh, for me. So it was nice to see everyone coming back. I know you made the comment that maybe you saw uh, just as many providers. I maybe saw less than I thought which should have been there. But but definitely there was no doubting that the volume of people definitely felt like this was pre-pandemic levels. I mean, there was a busyness and energy uh, from all the people that were there. I really liked that. So that to me was one of the nice things uh, and nice impressions that I got from 2023 so far. The other thing that I found was that the conference organizers uh, in general, just all of them, large, small, they were making, in my mind, some concerted efforts to really make their conferences more accommodating. And what I mean by that was 
um, you know, just more accommodating in terms of food options, uh, accommodating in terms of rest areas, areas that you could just sit and work, uh, areas that were a little bit more quiet. Um, a lot of thought was put into that, more thought was put into that than ever before in my mind. I mean, yes, it was fun to have a puppy park and all that stuff, but more important for people <laughs> is good Wi-Fi that was actually usable, places where people could actually plug in and work. I saw way more of that than ever before at the spring conferences. Yeah, and I, I think we're going to see a continued evolution of that where, you know, the old experiences aren't going to be enough. I heard one person describe that some events feel like you're 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 going and having a good time and other events feel like work. And, you know, and, and, and the question is, is that OK? Is that reasonable? Is there, you know, how do how do people feel about that? And I think the answer is we can have a good time and work. Right. Uh, you know, I think we see that in the HITMIC conference, right, our own healthcare marketing conference that, you know, like, for example, we have a casual dress. And has it impacted any of the work or business that's being done? No, people are comfortable and they still do work, right? I mean, we still have a goal to be there. We know our company's paid for us to be there. We want to achieve the goals that are there and, and that it doesn't necessarily impact people. So, you know, I think that's going to be an interesting outtake of this too, is people raising the bar on the engagement and the experience level that they have at the conference. Yeah, I think that's certainly true. I also think that's sort of been recognition of, uh, you know, hey, like, this is what people want, right? I think they're finally listening to some of this feedback and trying to be more more accommodating. So you're right. If it was just about the education, the online would have taken it off, but we've seen that it's not. Uh, I mean, there is, there is a place for that and people still do want just the education, but a lot more want that interaction. So more opportunities to network, uh, more opportunities to, to get together and as you say, have fun, but not at the expense of the learning and the seriousness that, you know, that healthcare really is. So uh, one of the trends, though, I'm, I'm hoping more for is, um, you know, definitely I think there should, should be more dessert stations, right, John? Uh, I think a few more ice <laughs> the cream Garrett's stations. The popcorn was good in Chicago, though, I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and a, and a few more a few more places for ice cream, I think, would always be good with us, right? Well, and I think that's actually an interesting observation. There were a couple of magicians, which actually are quite engaging and good for booths, but there wasn't the booth babes. There wasn't this over the top, you know, stuff at, at these conferences. I'd say the experience was was more focused on the product and the messaging. And sure, there was some swag, but nothing. It wasn't crazy, right? It was it seemed more reasonable that, you know, as opposed to trying to capture your attention with some booth babe that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, definitely. And I think that was the other trend I was going to mention is the the after parties, they were much more um, uh, subdued, if you will, uh, less, less flashy, I guess, is another way to put it. They were still great. Um, and, you know, they were great networking, but I think there was more focus on the networking as opposed to, you know, getting exorbitant food or really, you know, high class uh, hors d'oeuvres or anything like that. And I noticed also that a lot of companies were teaming together uh, to put on their events. So it wasn't just one company doing an event. Now right. it's three companies, mostly partners, getting together to say, hey, let's just do our events together um, and have a bigger potential for networking. So that's the trend actually I like. Uh, fewer parties to choose from is always a good <laughs> It's great for attendees. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, thanks to all of you who tuned in to this episode of Healthcare IT Today. You can find more details about our show by checking out the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And please share your opinions and your comments with us at healthcareittoday.com and on social media using the hashtag HITSM. I'm Colin Hong, along with my friend and health IT collaborator, John Lin. Thanks for listening and have a great week.